you very much for inviting me again today. I did speak at the inaugural conference last year and it was really interesting. Um, the title of my talk says Update to the Code of Conduct and Ethics. Um, we are currently in a stage of reviewing it as opposed to it having been updated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about where those revisions are likely to be, but mostly just a general, um, a general update on what you as members of the institution, your obligations are under the Code of Conduct. Hopefully you all are aware of what the current Code of Conduct is. There are eight articles of the Code of Conduct. One, to act with integrity and fairness. Two, to have regard to the public interest as well as the interests of all those affected by their professional activities. To uphold the reputation of the profession. To maintain and broaden your competence and where appropriate assist others to do so. To undertake only those tasks for which you are competent, to exercise appropriate skill and judgment, to not maliciously or recklessly injure or attempt to injure the reputation of another person, and to avoid, where at all possible, conflicts of interest. As a licensed institution of the Engineering Council, we're required to incorporate certain aspects into the Code of Conduct and also into of the other laws of the institution, including our disciplinary procedures. And the recent review of the Code of Conduct and our disciplinary procedures has been part of that process. And as a result, what we are recommending is that this will be, it's not massively um, enhanced, but it's, it's important in the small detail. The new Code of Conduct hopefully will say change to Article 1, which is to act with integrity and fairness, but also in accordance with the principles of ethical behaviour. And in number 5, the current one, but in addition to only accept those appointments for which you are competent. So, in addition to the articles, there's another part of the Code of Conduct. At the moment, it currently says that all members of the institution shall disclose to the institution if they have been convicted of a criminal offence. Again, as part of the review process, that will be... Sorry, this has jiggled around a bit since I've uh, sent it through to here. Um, if they've been convicted of a criminal offence or have been subject to an adverse finding by another organisation, to comply with the legislation of the country in which they are working to disclose to the institution upon being ba declared bankrupt and or becoming disqualified as a company director or a charity trustee. And an overarching one to comply with the laws of the Institution of Structural Engineers. Hopefully there's no one in here that would disagree that those are important things um, to comply with as an esteemed member of the institution. What are the laws of the institution? Well, here comes the dry bit. The bylaw 1E, I'm sure you're all very familiar with every single word in the bylaws and the charter. The laws of the institution is defined as the charter, the bylaws, the regulations, all and any standing orders, rules, codes of conduct, professional or ethical guidance notes, or other similar material published from time to time for the observance of members. So basically everything. <laughs> Bylaw 9 says that members are obliged to abide at all times to uphold the reputation of the profession and to observe the first bullet point, the laws of the institution. So ergo, the code of conduct and the guidance notes and the disciplinary procedural rules are considered laws of the institution and every single member, irrespective of grade, is obliged to abide by them. When a client appoints a member of the institution, they do so because there is an assurance of competency. That competency has been measured by the membership application process. They're assured a particular standard, and that standard, qualifying standard, is indicated by the membership grade that the member occupies. They're also appointing somebody who has signed up to ethical and professional codes of conduct 
and in doing so, all of your professional activities will be presented and delivered in a professional way, of course. There are pointing quality. There is pointing and assured quality. And on the very rare occasion that things go wrong, and they do go wrong, they're appointing somebody who has a body of support, both through the institution, both for the member, and also for the client. So when things don't go to plan, um, there's rarely a perfect project, and dare I say, very rarely a perfect client. Um, and many disputes arise originally out of unclear communications, which, which set the tone of the project. Common infringements include an inadequate or unclear initial brief, um, all too often um, and surprisingly, sometimes no written brief at all, which offers no protection either to the, the engineer or to the client. Charging extra fees without the client's approval or there being no agreement on the basis on which fees will be rendered. Failing to respond to communications within a reasonable time, or indeed, sometimes, failing to communicate at all, or failing to meet the agreed deadlines. I can't emphasise enough the importance of clear written terms. As I say, the majority of the complaints that come through to the institution are to do with poor communication in the first instance, and that does set a tone. And it's very often a very low level dispute which can then spiral into something much bigger. Sometimes ending up in court. And as Lindsay said before, you want to avoid that. And very often, um, the thing that sparked the dispute in the first place, by the time it spiraled to litigation, the time and the cost implications of following that through are invariably never proportional to the thing that started the original dispute. Other common infringements include carrying out tasks um, outside your level of expertise. That happens far less, actually, I have to say. The vast majority of complaints are not concerned with the member's technical competence at all. They're to do with business practice as opposed to um, technical expertise. Providing a report criticising another engineer's work without first notifying the original engineer, that's always a very difficult one. Um, and something that we do see, uh, see, still not a massive amount, but we are seeing an increasing number of complaints whereby clients move from employer to another employer or from an employer to setting up their own practice and they, um, they take clients without arrangement from their existing employer to their new outfit. I thought it might be useful just to run through a few of the scenarios that we see. They're not, there's nothing um, particularly startling in these and that's, that's the point basically that I'm trying to, to, trying to get across, that these are everyday occurrences. Um, and sometimes, the vast majority of the time, they will, have, they, they will event to nothing, but sometimes it's only a problem when it's a problem, and that's when we end up with complaints here to the institution. So we have a client, an architect, and an en engineer. It sounds like a start of a very bad joke, actually, but it, um, <laughs> well, it may be, I don't know, it may be. The client appoints the architect to undertake this domestic project, to undertake some work um, on their home. Client asks the architect, do you know any decent engineers out there? Of course he knows lots of our members, they're all very decent engineers. So the architect approaches the engineer, asks him if he can provide the design services for the client, which uh, for a ground floor extension to their property. The engineer says, yes, of course, bread and butter. And he provides, she provides a um, fee specification, a job specification, all to the client. Client agrees it. Good job. It's all, all, all working as we would expect it to. Halfway through the project, the architect contacts the engineer and says, there's been a project amendment. We now want you to do the design and calculations for the removal of two internal walls which the engineer dutifully does, provides those to the architect. 
And then the client and the architect fall out. Because the architect, you know. Is <laughs> <laughs> there any architects in here? So. <laughs> client appoints a new architect. Um, architect's very happy to work with the original engineer. Why wouldn't he be? He's dutifully, she has dutifully <coughs> provided all the services that um, were asked of him or her. <coughs> But then the project reverts back to the original, which is simply just a ground floor extension, all fine. But then the engineer sends an invoice for the work that he's completed on the ground floor extension and also on the removal of the two internal walls. The client doesn't know anything about it, or so they say. They dispute the fees, there's a project impasse, there's a delay to the project, and lo and behold, the client makes a complaint to the institution. There's no doubt that the engineer has completed the work, but it was completed without any, any authorization by the client. No rediscussion, no, no further discussion, no, no, no agreement in terms of additional fees. And at this stage, it's probably likely that the engineer is going to get it entangled in any dispute that's still going on with the client and the original architect as well. It's a whole mess. So, actually, in that case, it's very likely that going through the complaint process, though it is likely that there would be a finding in terms of the breach of the code of conduct in terms of one, two, and three, possibly six. Which seems harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> but... Something that we also see fairly often is that there are a number of portals in existence and possibly some of you use those portals where they, uh, online, uh, online services whereby um, a client can go and visit a particular portal and it puts them in contact with um, a, a professional from the construction industry, be it architects, surveyors, structural engineers, contractors. But what happens with those portals is that the front-end marketing is offering something that the engineer isn't offering. So what happens is you have a client who... Does anybody still use computers like that? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> requests a full structural survey through this portal. The portal then provides the information to the engineer, which is requesting a structural inspection. Client makes payment, payment's received dutifully by the engineer, and the engineer provides, that should say, the delivery of a structural inspection report. The client's not happy at all. He was expecting a, a 10-page report with uh, full sets of drawings, and, that, and he's got a one-and-a-half-page report. It's inadequate. As as far as the client's concerned, the engineer has provided what he said he was going to provide. The client demands a refund, <coughs> that's rejected by the member, and the client invariably makes a complaint to the institution. In this case, there is a responsibility on members to make sure that the, the, the service that's being advertised, whether it's by them personally or whether it's by a third party, in this case this portal, is, is the service that they're actually going to provide. And the responsibility is always on the member. Um, it's not reasonable to expect a third-party marketing tool, which is all the portal is, to provide your advertising services without checking it. If, indeed, in this case, there isn't, there was no clarification of service, what should have happened? Once the instruction, once the introduction to the instruction was made, the engineer should then have confirmed terms with the client and confirmed the fees. When there's no clarification of service, it is very likely that there would be a finding against the member, probably Articles 2 and 3. And when, you do, when that clarification of service is made, it should be made before the project commences, but it should also be repeated within the report itself. And it's just covering yourselves twice, three times. Another common complaint to the institution is about um, lack of communication from 
um, from, from the engineer to the client, causing delays to the project. Um, there's lots of reasons why delays to projects might happen, and the, many of them, if not most of them, might be outside of the hands of the engineer. The client goes to the engineer and, and says, why is my project delayed? Why is this happening? He's got about 10 different contractors working on it, but it has to be the engineer's fault that it's all delayed. The client doesn't accept the engineer's initial explanation and requires an immediate solution. He wants it done yesterday. The client emails and telephones daily, sometimes twice, sometimes three times in a day. You do get to a point where we're all human where you just start ignoring those persistent emails and phone calls. I never do that, by the way. So when I'm being phoned <laughs> persistently by members of the public, the same ones, I never know. I, no, I don't know. Um, at that point, the client threatens to withhold payment. The member threatens to, real, it's justifiably, to withhold their service. A project impasse occurs, further delays to the project, and the member initiates legal process to recover their fees. And the client complains to the institution. It's, whilst it might be understandable, it's almost never justifiable to ignore persistent phone calls and communications from a client. It will only ever serve to increase the frustration and level of dissatisfaction. We talk about, we always talk about reasonable timescales and obviously what's reasonable to a client and what's reasonable to an engineer might be completely different. But again, that's about setting it out in the initial stages, making sure that you manage those expectations about delivery timescales, um, response timescales. We do it here at the institution. We set down a, a, a manageable expectation of when we will be able to respond to queries. I know it's different when you're working on a one-to-one -one personal basis with a client, but if you can set those expectations at the beginning, and sometimes they change, obviously, as projects change, but you always have something to go back to. Ignoring a client, ignoring phone calls, ignoring the institution, that happens as well, um, is likely to result in a breach of Articles 1, 2, 3, possibly 6. Um, again, this is this is this is all, this is always a very tricky complaint to deal with because it very often deals with two members of the institution as opposed to a client and a member. You have a client who engages engineer one, provides them with specification one to provide a design package. Engineer dutifully provides that design package to the client. The client goes. Blimey, that's expensive. I can't afford to do that. I'll go to another chap or chapess. It gives them slightly different specification. You might want something quite similar, but the budget is greatly reduced and uh, perhaps the materials are different. Second engineer is also asked on the side, can you just have a look at that first engineer's design in, with regards to cost. You know, I've given you the specification. Can you just see why he's come up with something so expensive? So he provides design package two to the client. Client's quite happy. It's about half the cost of the original design package. So the client disputes the first engineer's fees. And the second design package provides that justification, or so the client thinks justification, for non-payment. Lo and behold, second engineer is appointed and engineer one complains to the institution. The, I would say probably the, the largest number of phone calls that I take from our members is to seek advice because they've been asked by a client to review the work of another engineer and how they go about doing it. And there are, there are set uh, guidelines set down within the Code of Conduct and the guidance notes, um, but as with all guidance notes, they, don't, it, it, they are generic and they don't always um, provide all of the information that you need for very specific situations. Ideally, the, the best situation is that the client is transparent and open, gives you access to the first engineer, gives you the first specification. Um, 
that doesn't always happen. Um, invariably, the client is thinking the first design is going to be too expensive, so I'm not going to do that. So I need to redesign something else, but I also don't want to pay for something that I'm not going to use, um, which is not the fault of the first engineer at all. At this stage, it's also not the fault of the second engineer. They've, as far as they're concerned, they've been given a, a, a different brief, a different specification, and they can design to that. The issue comes where they're asked to review the design of the first engineer, particularly on the basis of cost, if they're not aware that they haven't been given the same specification. And you know, it's, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, the second engineer has, in this example, been given a different specification. He's been given a different budget. She's been given different materials to work with. It's a different job. Um, always have things written down. You should request... You should request, as I say, transparency from the client. The client obviously may well not give it to you for various different reasons, but you should always have that request written down and have the client's, um, uh, ha have the client's refusal provided to you written down as well. Um, if you're concerned, if you're asked to critique or appraise another engineer's work and you become concerned about any work that they've done, particularly from a safety perspective. Again, there are very specific guidelines set down in the Code of Conduct to deal with that. So, an over... If we go back to um, item D in what will be the new Code of Conduct, um, the overarching obligation to members is to comply with the laws of the institution, and as we saw, that includes both the code of conduct, the guidance notes, and also the disciplinary process itself. We do have, on occasion, uh, members who have complaints against them who fail, just completely disregard the whole process and don't respond to a complaint. Um, the other scenario is that they do proceed through the complaint process, and when it comes to it, the there is a decision, the complaint is upheld, either fully or to, to an extent and, this, and there's a sanction imposed and the member fails to comply with the decision or, the, or a sanction. That of itself could be a breach of Article 3 of the Code of Conduct and the Professional Conduct Committee have the power to amend a complaint to add charges if they see fit. In the case where a member fails to comply with a decision or sanction, the Professional Conduct Committee can order a short-term suspension of 60 days, and that, uh, that, that can be done sequentially, so there can be two or three suspensions of 60 days all running after each other. Um, it doesn't, go, doesn't tend to go any longer than that. My experience with the PCC is that they may issue two short-term suspensions before they refer the failure to comply to the disciplinary board. And a disciplinary board has within its powers um, the power to order long-term suspension for up to five years or permanent expulsion. There are lots of reasons why our members don't respond. Um, and it isn't all just about disregard for the process. Sometimes it's because our members are experienced illness or failing health. Um, and the process itself is set up to, in order for the institution to support the members through that illness and failing health in order for them to comply with their obligations as a member of the institution. But in order for us to offer that support, there has to be communication back from the member. This, um, this seems very severe, it, uh, and it happens very rarely, but it does happen. The whole disciplinary process is not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be... Um, it, 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 the vast majority of sanctions which are opposed on our members are to affect change. It's to make sure that, that, that something, an occasion which has happened through poor business practice is, is changed, and therefore it doesn't happen again. It's not meant to be... Punitive. That said, it is rigorous, um, and in the rare circumstances where a member has been found to lack integrity or has been found to be dishonest, 
either during the process or in the um, matters given rise to the original complaint, then the institution does take the strongest line available to it. And the reason for that is reputational risk and harm to the profession, both to yourselves as individual practitioners and also to the profession itself, is of paramount importance to the institution. We exist because we have over 30,000 members and the reputation of those individuals is very important. That said, should we keep it into a little bit of context? We have over 30,000 <coughs> members in our membership. On average, the PCC looks at about 35 cases a year. So about 35 cases are escalated as being one within the jurisdiction of the PCC and on the face of it, potentially, there is a case to answer. Last year, in 2017, uh, complaints against small practitioners of those average 35 was in excess of 85%. Just checking the stats earlier, it's, so far this year it's 75%, so we're doing well. It's good. <laughs> of, um, of those 35 cases average, about 70% are upheld, which means that the PCC find, have found the member to be in breach of the Code of Conduct, a minor breach, 1995 very specific statistics there it's about 90 percent in minor breach and about 10 percent will go through to the disciplinary board it's important to say that whilst the majority of complaints to the institution are made about people like yourselves people acting either as sole or small practitioners does not in any way reflect the engineering capability or technical competence of those members. Um, the case studies, you'll see from those that they typically arise out of poor or naive business practice and or poor judgment and very often can be a one or two time blip. We do know that our sole and small practitioners are more vulnerable to complaint when you're face to face with clients and they're not always the best behaved. Small companies very often have a lack of a complaint process during periods of illness or even if it's planned leave, but illness is more difficult because it's, because it's unplanned. There's very often no delegation or support. Lindsay talked very much about the cash flow system, the 60 days. Well, some of our members, you know, 60 days is too long as well. You know, it's uh, 14 days, 28 days. Um, and also a perceived lack of access to early advice. But we do, my last slide, we do, there is a lot of support available from the institution. The written guidance notes are meant to be a positive document. I think sometimes clients get hold of them and use them as a stick to beat you with, but, it, it, but they are, they are, their intention is to be a positive document. We have the statement of ethics that we've um, signed up to. There are a number of business practice notes which emanate from the business practice committee. Um, we have a, a the t telephone and email advice directly to myself. Um, I'm always, as I said, I don't ignore your phone calls or your emails, I promise, I don't. Um, I'm always on hand, but, um, ideally, to sort out issues before they actually occur, but obviously also there um, if uh, during a period of dispute with the client as well. And... Um, I'm very pleased to say that we have very recently set up a free legal advice helpline as well with um, a very experienced team of solicitors called Muckle LLP and Rob Langley, one of their consultants, is leading one of the sessions later this afternoon, I think. Um, and that's a, 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 a special helpline just for our members which offers free legal advice on engineering and construction issues. And that's me. And I'd be, I'd be very, very happy to answer any questions throughout today or later on um, after the conference. Very often things come to you there on afterwards. Thank you.